Collins. Um, Michael, I, I first met Michael, uh, you know, we, well, we know each other starting our grad student days. Um, so he did his PhD with Misha Lukin uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, graduated in 2013. Then he was a postdoc at um, the National Institutes uh, for Standards and Technology in Maryland. Uh, for a few years. And subsequently, he was a postdoc um, at Princeton, where again, we uh, met up. Uh, and uh, so, so Michael has done some very, very interesting things in generally speaking, quantum information science, sometimes towards more condensed matter. Um, uh, but I think the, the most recent set of problems that he's been working on is particularly very, very exciting. Um, so the so I'm sure he's going to talk to you about uh, today about uh, these quantum random circuits where Michael, along with uh, you know David Hughes at Princeton, they've uh, really uncovered some very very beautiful physics, including you know deep connections between thermalization and quantum error correcting codes and the statistical mechanics of entanglement phase transition. So I'm very very excited to to listen to what all the new things that Michael has to say. Um, so, Michael, I guess is uh, I guess uh, for the past month or so, you've uh, been at now uh, back. You're back in Maryland now as a, as hopefully a full, you know, as an uh, assistant professor. Um, but you're you're uh, in the department of physics, uh, the department of computer science, and also in the nanoscale fabrication devices department, characterization department at NIST. So you're, uh, hopefully that's an adequate description of your roles. If I made a mistake, I'm sorry, there's just a lot of them. Um, and uh, so, uh, yes, for the talk. Uh, so the talk will be 15 minutes. Uh, first 40 minutes, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, you know, um, a kind of a, Heads up, uh, so you can try to wrap up. And after the 15 minutes, 10 minutes of questioning, uh, and you know, Michael has indicated that he's happy to uh, take questions uh, in the middle of the talk. So please uh, unmute yourself by pressing the space key and go ahead and ask your questions. Um, all right, Michael, uh, welcome. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks, Partik, for the very nice introduction. It's nice to uh, nice to be here in, in McGill and. Quebec. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, a lot of this work was done while I was at um, in my postdoc at Princeton, and I sort of continued continued thinking about these questions um, at my new position. You know, I'm at NIST, and I have a, a joint position at University of Maryland. So that's that's kind of how to understand it all. There's there's you know lots of Join institutes there as a way of sort of sharing resources. Um, okay, so right, so let me get on with the with the talk. So the right, so so um, right, so the references for this. So yeah, so what I want to tell you about today is this problem of dynamics of quantum information and monitored non-equilibrium many-body systems. So this is. Um, you know, this is what, what I'm going to try and present. This is really a new class of quantum mini quantum mini body dynamics, and we're you know start just starting to understand some of the problems in this area. So some of the so the you know the the main references for this work are shown here. So there's a paper that um, you know it's a posting from from a year ago, but it's it's going to be published soon. And we have another shorter paper. Um, you know, which I'll talk about as well today. And some of the other, so other work and collaborations are, are listed, listed here. And then uh, part of what I'm going to tell you about today is, a, is actually an experimental collaboration with Chris Monroe's group at the University of Maryland. So where we're trying to see some of the, some of the physics I'll describe. So I'll actually spend a fair bit of the talk um, on, you know, on the recent, ex, you know, recent progress in the experiment, because I think it, it can, it can help um, sort of, you know, understand what we're doing in, in a more realistic setting. Okay, so the, you know, the main motivation for me, and, you know, I'm kind of, as Kartik mentioned, I'm kind of 
coming from this quantum formation background is, um, is that you know, many of us think that when we talk about sustained memory transmission or processing of quantum formation, that will be some kind of non-equilibrium process where you, you're, you're sort of measuring a system and then applying feedback um, you know, to ultimately produce error correction or, or fault tolerance. But you know, when you talk about put, putting this in the you know, broader context of physics, I think it, it fits nicely into this you know, sort of recent realization that this problem of unitary dynamics in closed quantum systems is actually in many ways a frontier across different areas of, of physics. So if we think of the, you know, the, the states we're used to studying and understanding in nature, that they generally have this description in terms of low complexity. We think of those low complexity or short range entangled states like ground states and thermal states. But we, you know, we know that unitary evolution will, will take, will generally, you know, generate high complexity in the system and huge and large amounts of entanglement. Um, but on the other hand, we, we have this other picture that, you know, when you have an open quantum system, so if you don't have control over the environment, then there's, there's a sense in which you, you actually don't explore this full Hilbert space and, and you end up back in, um, you know, in, in a low complexity state. Um, and so this, this kind of problem touches into, you know, condensed matter physics, quantum simulation, um, older ideas in quantum chaos, and then recent work in mini-body localization. Um, and then in the context of quantum formation, this is really the heart of quantum complexity and quantum speed up. So this problem of you know, unit, unitary quantum dynamics. And then there's also you know, interest in these problems even in high energy physics. Um, so, so when we talk about a monitored non-equilibrium mini body system, it's an interesting paradigm because it, it falls in between these two types of dynamics. So it's not fully open system dynamics, it's a sense in which you can, you know, you can have, um, you can have some kind of effective evolution, effective buildup of entanglement in the system. So just to, to give you a sense of the, you know, the type of problems I, been th I think about in my, you know, in my work, it's, it's, um, you know, the schematic is shown here. So, you know, we think of we have a, we have a many body quantum system with this is open quantum system. So we have a many body quantum system with some internal Hamiltonian. It's, it's coupled to, you know, the, an environment which is uncontrolled. But then there's another part of the environment, which we think of as having, you know, a large amount of control over and that that can involve really three ingredients. So there's, there's drive, there's driven parts of the system, so control fields that you apply. Uh, there's also, you know, measurements. So if you, if you're monitoring the system while you're, while you're actually controlling it, that that's a, another, you know, type of action on the system. And then ultimately you can, you can then feedback um, on the system. So the way we think about this dynamics is you have a, you know, an input mini body quantum state, and then the, you know, the output is another quantum state, a density matrix. But in addition to the density matrix, you also get, in this case where, you know, measurements are important, you also get a measurement, measurement record. So this is some kind of classical data in the system, uh, which, which labels things we, what we call quantum trajectories. Um, so, so, you know, in case this is a, a bit abstract, I want to, I want to give you a nice uh, experimental realization of these quantum trajectories and, uh, from a you know recent experiment. So the, this idea goes back to, you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, these are kind of old ideas in quantum optics, um, but they're you know recently explored quite a bit in quantum formation, particularly because of these connections to error correction, which I'll describe. Um, Okay, so here, here's a nice experiment from uh, Michelle Deveray's group at Yale. So here they're studying a three-level system formed from two transmon qubits. So you have a, you know, you have a, a ground state, which, which is the initial state, and then you have an, two excited states. So one is a dark state, which means it, it doesn't emit photons very often. Um, so this is a transmon coupled to a cavity, and the other is a bright state, so it's sort of rapidly rapidly emitting um, photons. Okay, so we also have these drives in the system. So 
you know, what's special about this experiment is that every, every photon that's being um, emitted is actually being recorded by a, by a microwave photon uh, uh, detector. And so the, so the type of, the type of data you get in this problem is, is illustrated here. So be, because we're, we're sort of monitoring the emission of these photon events. So if you were just driving the system and it was decaying into a bath, you know, you would just end up in a steady, mixed steady state density matrix. But because of this, um, you know, this extra measurement, measurement action, you, you have a much richer dynamic. So it becomes more, you know, the time degree of freedom um, becomes like, a, like an extra degree of freedom in the system. And you, you know, you see this, this dynamics where you're switching so here, here are these different colors show different states of the system in real time. Um, so you can see the, you know, the, the transmon is in the bright state, it moves to the dark, the ground state, and then there are these, these intermittent periods where it switches between dark. So, you know, you can see there's really a rich, um, a rich type of, of, of dynamics here. Okay, but, but what, I, what I want to talk about today is, is more many, you know, many body systems. Um, so there we're going to think about systems which aren't just extended in time, but also ex extended in space. And we want to think about, you know, um, scaling limits. We're taking systems of lar large time and, and, and large systems. And what happens in that context is you, you have this notion of, of uh, fault tolerance. So when in these monitored systems, so it's not, um, and, you know, this really underlies, you know, this connection that I was mentioning at the beginning between closed system dynamics and open system dynamics. When you, when you have monitoring, there's, there's this potential for, a, for actually a phase transition where you know, at, some, at some finite error rate, you, can, you have sort of these success phases where you're able to protect um, you know, information from, you know, from coupling to the environment. And then there's this threshold where, you, where, you, where that fails. Um, right, so this is a phase transition between the success and failure of this, you know, storage transmission or processing of information. So it's, it's really a dynamical phase transition in a sense. Um, so so when, when we talk about the success phase, this is, you know, in, in the, the sort of most relaxed way to define success is where, is where some parameters where the output density matrix contains some quantum information from the input density matrix. And what that means is that, you know, quantum information has been sort of remembered or transmitted or, or even processed by the system. And when we go to this failure phase, there is, um, you know, this output density matrix actually contains no quantum information from the input. So, you know, there, there's classical information from the measurement record, but there's no, you know, there's really no quantum information um, left over. And so that's what we think of happening in the, in the failure phase. And so, you know, what the, the basic question we want to address in this talk is, you know, tr try and understand simpler physical models that, that have this such, such a, a type of fault tolerant phase transition. And so that, that leads me to the, you know, the main subject of the talk, which is these called mo monitored random quantum circuits. So these are, you know, these are a class of models which, which have this, this phase transition. And they also have a very simple structure. So these were first introduced um, in this paper by uh, Lee, Chin, and Fisher. And they've been explored by many other groups. Um, I want to highlight the, these these two papers in addition in addition to our work, which which also take a very similar um, sort of coding perspective on this problem. This is Choi, Bao, Chi, and Altman, and um, and this is from Ber Berkeley and Stanford, and then Fan, VJ, Vishwanath from Harvard, and Yu from UC San Diego. Okay, so the um, right, so the so the you know the the, the the model we're studying is, is rather simple. So it's, it's, so here I'm talking about a one dimensional quantum system. So this is a chain of qubits and we have a mix, you know, mixed state at the input. Um, and then we have a random, random unitary circuit. But what we're going to do is 
intersperse the circuit with, um, with you know, quantum projective measurements, which are random in space and also time. So there's a, so, you know, each, each, in between each layer of gates, we, we measure, you know, each qubit with some probability in the Z basis. And so at the output, well, you'll get a, you know, a quantum state, but then you also get a measurement record. So each of these, in this case, that's the string of bits from each of these measurements. And that's, you know, part of the data in the system. Um, right, so this, so, you know, what's, what's now understood quite well is that this model ha has this, this kind of phase transition I was alluding to earlier where for, for very few measurements, there's, there's kind of a, there's this success phase um, where quantum information is being, you know, processed in the system. And then for too many measurements, you, you have the, the failure phase. So, so the, so the way this is set up is that, you know, if we go back to our picture for an open quantum system, so we're sort of removing, you know, in some sense we're removing the uncontrolled part of the environment and we, we're just having this, uh, this, you know, random uh, me measurement part of the environment. And we're also removing the feedback in some sense. So the feedback can only be in this problem, it's only in the, in correlating the measurement record with, with the output state. So, you know, we've, we've sort of simplified the, the model uh, quite substantially. Um, right, so as I mentioned, it has, you know, it has the, so if you take this scaling limit, you take large space and long time, you, you get this phase transition from the failure phase where the, the measurements essentially, you know, they collapse it into a, they collapse the state into a deterministic state and you destroy the, Quantum information from the input state, and then below this, you know, below this measurement rate, there's a success phase where where the you have this unitary entangling dynamics, which is able to encode quantum information, um, you know, that starts in the input state. Some of it survives essentially uh, in the output state. So, are there any questions on on this on the setup here? I might have a question. Go ahead. So um, when you look at your density matrix output in the, um, in the success phase, do, do we have um, some kind of protocol to actually recover the, the information that was previously encoded? Yeah, so, so I'll, that sort of gets it, a bit gets at the heart of the problem is that it's, um, yeah, there's a decoding, there's sort of a decoding step you need to do. So you, you're given the measurement record and you're given, you know, the, the output state and you need, you know, you need to do some kind of decoding given that measurement record. You need, you need to, when you, when you analyze the output state, you need to use the information from the measurement record. And that's, that's part of the, you know, in error correction that would be called the decoding step. Um, and that, that, that's going to come up later, especially when we talk about experiments. So yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a question that often comes up because um, if you, you know, if you look at this dynamics, if you were to trace over the measurement outcomes, it, it just goes to infinite temperature. Um, and it, and the, you know, this, this is, a, this is also, a, you know, a, I think in quantum optics, we've known about quantum trajectories for years, and we, we never thought of them as, as physical in some sense. Um, but, you know, if you really think of it as a, you know, there's different perspectives on it. So here, here we're really taking the perspective where the trajectory is a, is a really physical evolution. Um, but yeah, this gets into to quantum measurement, so it's, it's bound to lead to arguments, I think. Um, Thank you. Okay, so, um, right, so in terms of, you know, what, what are the observables to see this transition? So it turns out it, it doesn't show up in, in simple observables, um, just based on the output density matrix. You, you need to look at these sort of more information theoretic observables. So the most, the most natural one is to look at uh, the entanglement, so the half cut entanglement of the system. So here you, you start in a, you start in a, a pure state and then the output is, is also a pure state. 
and then the, the transitions that transition from you know a short short range area law entanglement in the output state to a long range entanglement or you know, volume law entanglement um, and you, you and then you know at the critical point there's a there's actually some conformal some seemingly some conformal symmetry that emerges in, in this one plus one dimensional system and you get a logarithmic scaling um, so that's you know one of the interesting aspects is understanding the the, the critical points here so there's there's actually a nice uh, geometric picture which gives you a lot of qualitative insight into this entanglement transition and there you think of um, you think of these measurements as as sort of cut cutting bonds in the in the network and then you have a mapping you know with the measurement rate you get a mapping to percolation um, you know above some above a certain above for this square lattice above a measurement rate a half there's a percolation transition that that doesn't seem that doesn't seem to accurately describe you know the the quote unquote true transition that we're interested in but it gives you a lot of insight into the into the problem and then there's there's another uh, class of work which i won't touch on today much is 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 sort of mapping this quantum you know this is a one plus one dimensional quantum system mapping it to a two-dimensional uh, classical statistical mechanics problem with that and so there there there's nice work using re replica treatments michael uh, just for clarification i think um so the entanglement transition that you described so here you start with a uh, simple pure state is that correct right yeah right and and then at the end of this depending on how much how many measurements you do you can get either a volume law entangled state or an area law entangled state uh, and 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 similar features exist in the if you start with the density matrix, but that's this is this is what you're saying with this plot, S of A versus A. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So what what we what we actually looked at is this this problem where you 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 don't start in a, a pure state. You actually start in a mixed state, um, and and there you you can so the the picture the picture there is is that a, you know a mixed state is really um, is really, you know, characterizing your uncertainty about the initial state. So it's so when you have a mixed quantum state, it's it's in some sense it, it's encoding quantum information. It may be inaccessible to you, but the state is is has information encoded. And then the 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 question of this phase transition becomes whether the measurements can access that encoded uh, quantum information. And so the the phase transition in that case, it turns out um, it's a pure it's what we call a purification transition or memory transition. So above the if you start in a mixed a mixed quantum state, then above the you know phase transition point, the the state will purify at a constant rate, and then below this below this point, the purification time actually diverges um, exponentially. So it's some kind of long, you know, long range ordering in the time direction. Um, and there's two cases where this is simple to understand. So one is when the measurement rate is one, then you imagine you start say an infinite temperature state, then even a single layer of measurements will project you into a, a product state. And it, it turns out that the other limit, sort of non-trivial limit, which is simple to understand is when P is, is infinitesimal compared to um, you know, some kind of scrambling time in the system. So, so not when it's a finite value, but when it's, it's just as, you know, less, than, less than one over L. And there, what, what the, the picture is that you, you, have a, you, know, you have initial quantum information and then the unitary evolution acts like a, a random encoding of that information. And the, the measurements are essentially, you know, try, trying to collapse that state. But because, you know, we know that random, har random states are, are very um, good at protecting quantum information, the, you know, that, that becomes inaccessible to the, uh, to the measurements. And then after each measurement, you, you know, you have a sort of re-encoding step where, where the information gets re-encoded. 
and then you know this this will persist for exponentially large number of measurements because the only time you you can collapse the state is when it really fluctuates down to a, a single site. Um, so this this is the you know different perspective on the on the transition. Um, so what I what I wanted to show you here is actually numeric you know very uh, convincing numerical data from from these these quantum circuits which are not um, which are not generic in some sense they're they're called Clifford circuits and and what what that means is that we can we have an efficient classical algorithm um, to simulate their dynamics so we can so we can study large you know we can study large systems and you know the Cl Clifford their stabilizers, these Clifford or stabilizer circuits, they're, they're of interest in quantum information for you know, a variety of reasons, but in, but in particular, they, they often come up in quantum error correction. Um, okay, so this is the, you know, this is the basic uh, phenomenology. So above, above the measurement rate, we have this pure phase. So here I'm starting in a you know, a mixed state, and this is the entropy density of that state after a long, after a time which scales with the system size. And then you see these, you know, these two, these two phases. So there's the pure phase where the, the, the density matrix goes to a pure quantum state, and then there's this mixed phase where it retains some residual entropy density. And so the picture here is this information is being stored and, and protected um, from the measurements. So, so what I want to do now is is present sort of a third perspective on the transition, which is which is really um, as as a as a coding or transition of the problem, um, and so this this ties into you know this this basic idea of, of even classical classical error correction in, in information theory, um, and so the you know there's this idea of of uh, you know, noisy channel coding. So you have, you know, if you want to send information, classical or quantum, across a, a noisy channel, we we use, you know, some kind of encoding and then a decoding step. Um, and you know, this this was developed in the classical case, you know, all the way back um, in this you know, foundational work. And then it, these ideas were extended to. Uh, the quantum case and a series of papers, um, you know, in the '90s, in the early 2000s, and the you know the central idea that that comes out of thinking about this problem theoretically um, is this notion of a channel capacity. So if you, you know, if you have an error rate in the system, um, and then you know you're trying to you're trying to send information, and that that's essentially the the, the we call the code rate for the problem, um, and then for you know for every every amount of information you want to send, there's some there's some maximal um, you know there's some maximal maximal error rate you can tolerate, and so that's that's sort of looking at the so we're you know we're looking at the optimal encoding and, and decoding step, um, and so if you if you take a cut at a fixed code rate. Then you'll see a, and then you look at the, you know, the optimal encoder and decoder. This is the problem actually Shannon was studied, and then in the quantum case, these authors were studying. Um, you, you, you have a, you have a, 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 this phase transition where, you know, for the optimal code, um, the the failure probability will will converge to zero um, below threshold, and then and then will converge to one above above threshold. Um, but but you know what's interesting is that this this transition you know at finite code rate it's it's better understood as type of first order phase transition. So you go from you you go from encoding you know essentially no information in the system to encoding some finite amount. So it's a very abrupt um, change in, in the system. But but you know what 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 we know is that if you go you know, if you go to um, zero code rate, then this becomes more like a second order transition where you're, you're just asking if you can, you know, encode a single, a single uh, bit or qubit in the system. Um, and, you know, what basically our, essentially our observation was that this picture for the channel capacity is, 
is very similar to what we observe for the purification transition. So, so this is a, you know, this is another second order phase transition. And what, what the way, the way to understand this residual entropy, uh, you know, of the mixed phase is actually the, the channel capacity um, for, for this monitored random uh, dynamics. And so there's really a sense in which, you know, this is not, it's not just one phase transition, it's, it's, it's kind of a whole line of uh, phase transition in the system. But yeah, and, I, and that's, that's one of the open questions of this work is really, you know, understanding the nature of, well, the, these phase transitions have to, are not well understood, but also even maybe less understood as the nature of these phase transitions. Uh, Michael, can I ask, are you um, assuming or saying at all that the optimal encoding and decoding is, is by a random Haar unitary? Is that, is that why one can think of these two things very similarly or they, are they distinctive? Yeah, so that's, I think that's a good intuition. Um, and then actually, so what, what, we, what we were able to, to what, I, yeah, what I want to discuss here is, um, is you know, ma making, is sort of making that picture on the last side more precise and sort of sum summarizing our understanding of this problem. So, so we, yeah, so, so, so the, you know, the, the way I wanted to summarize that was just by stating this, uh, this, this theorem, which, you know, which we, uh, which we showed. And I mean, it's, it's actually a relatively simple theorem, but it, it captures kind of the intuition that, that you, that you have Kartik. So, so if you have, um, right. So if you have this, so, you know, this channel, which is a, a monitored random circuit and it has this, you know, this, uh, purification transition, then it turns out that the the density matrices um, that you get from running the you know the, the infinite temperature initial state actually define um, these kind of capacity achieving codes. And so the so the picture is that you know we have you know we have a an input state. And then we have this, um, you know, then we have this monitored dynamics, and that's that's some kind of irreversible non-unitary evolution. But at the output, we will have a, you know, if there's residual entropy density in the system, then you know we'll have a we'll have a new uh, and sort of encoded density matrix, where the, where this is sort of a mixture over the states in the code space, um, and then what ends up happening. For these for these monitored systems, is that the future evolution acting on the these are random these are really random codes. In the case where there's no measurements, this is like a har random code. Um, the you know the the future evolution um, acts as un unitary evolution. So that that's 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 sort of a picture we have for the for the um, both you know the success phase. And the, so the effective dimension of this code space is, is just the entropy of the, the mixed state. And then this, this code space vanishes at the, at the critical point. Um, right, so this is the statement that uh, the, the dynamics of the system is, is, is actually, it's not just encoding quantum information, but what's sort of interesting to us is that it's doing it in an, in an optimal way. It's, it's achieving the capacity in the system. So that was surprising. That was a surprising result. Okay. So, um, I th so how much time do I have, Kartik? Uh, so, in pre I mean, uh, in about eight minutes, you will have reached the forty-minute mark. So maybe eighteen minutes, and then we take questions. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, so so I've been, yeah I've been talking about the basic phenomenology. I wanted to to give you a sense for what what the dynamics is in this system. Um, so when when so when you're when you're you know below capacity in this in this aerial R pure phase, then the the entropy of the system will decay exponentially. So you'll you'll sort of quickly decay to zero. Um, as you as you approach uh, the critical point, there's this critical slowing down, you get a, a power law decay. 
And then, um, you know, what, in this mixed phase, what happens is you have some initial transient, but then there's this plateau that, that persists for exponentially long times before eventually decaying to zero on, on exponential scales. Um, and so this way to understand this plateau, it's, it's sort of the density of logical qubits uh, left over in the system. And, you know, that, so then the other point I want to make about this is, is the, um, so that, so in the previous slide, I was talking about the, the dynamics when you're, you know, when, when you're actually not doing an optimal encoding. Um, you know, one other, another point we, we found is that the, the, this, this dynamical process for the optimal code generation actually has a, a much richer structure. So at, um, at, at times of order L, there's some initial transient, which is like a power law. So there's sort of, there's no scale, you know, even though we're deep in the ordered phase, there's sort of no scale for the um, dynamics of this, this density matrix formation. And then on these polynomial time scales, it sort of saturates and before again, eventually uh, decaying, decaying to zero. Um, so that you know, we, we don't we don't actually don't really understand, um, you know, this picture at this point. But the the you know the some basic intuition is that you know for times about times ab above here, the we have this random quantum code which is being generated by a random circuit, but it it's actually retaining some kind of locality structure, so it remembers that it came from a a local random circuit and then um, but you know as you as you get into this regime you know on much longer time scales it starts to look much more like a random a random code and so so this you know this is maybe more of a, a technical comment but th but this is you know potentially potentially interesting for looking at connections to eigenstate thermalization if you're familiar with that concept um, because this, this, you know, this, this crossover from a from a from a local from a sort of local code to a random code, it's it's an, it's, it's it's analogous to to the breakdown of random matrix theory um, in you know local Hamiltonian systems. So if you if you think of a local Hamiltonian looking, you know, on large energy scales, we know it. We, you can you can see the the local structure, but then as you as you get to much smaller scales, it starts to, to look like a random system. Okay, so may, maybe I'll, um, yeah, I'll just cover this uh, briefly. So we, right, so here, here I'm showing the um, this sort of spatial correlations of this density matrix. Um, and I think, you know, what's interesting is that if we look at this code space density matrix, it in the contrast to so pure states were found to have this volume loss scaling. So these mixed states actually have a have a subextensive scaling of their their correlation. So it's you know it's again a signature of this local structure in the problem. And um, right, and then there, there's interesting properties of the the code distance, but that's maybe more more technical. Okay, so um, okay, so now I want to talk about uh, a sort of scheme to to probe this experiment in, in sort of you know more realistic systems. I mean, admittedly, these are quantum computers that we want to that we want to study this in, but um, you know, people are trying to build these. So. <laughs> but uh, right, so the you know the idea is. Um, is actually to look at a simpler problem. So before I was studying the purification of a you know large mixed state, um, but it turns out you can you can study the the entropy of just the single a single reference qubit um, and how its entanglement survives with the system. So that this is this is of interest in in quantum formation that we we call metrics like this. They're called entanglement fidelities. Uh, so, so if you want to characterize how um, coherent a, a, you know, how close to unitary evolution a quantum process is, it's actually convenient to to do so by entangling it with a reference system, and 
and looking at how it preserves entanglement with the reference. And so, so the, and again, this is, this is after optimal decoding. So that, that so you, you know, you, you have to, um, entanglement fidelity looks at the, it's going to look at an overlap of this state with the final state. So you, you have to do some decoding process. Um, okay, so here I'm looking again at the, looking at this probe of the transition in, in the stabilizer circuit model. And, you know, so SQ is the entropy of the single reference qubit. And again, you can see the phase transition that below the, you know, below the critical point that the, um, this entropy converges to one, and then it converges to zero um, above the critical point. So there's, so in some sense, this decoding, this entanglement fidelity is converging to one here, and it converges to zero um, at that point. Okay, so, so one, one of the, the nice um, features of this, of, you know, of this probe is that it actually, um, it, it, you know, it has some, it has some notion of locality in the system. So if you, if you entangle the, the reference uh, with a local site and then evolve the circuit, you can look at, you know, you can look at how, what, what measurements actually reduce the entropy or, or gained information about the state of the reference. And what you find is there's some kind of emergent light cone where there's only measurements within a, you know, some, some um, light cone from the initial point can actually gain information about the, about the state of the system. And this, this is interesting because these, these, are, these are models with entanglement and um, measurements. So there's really no reason to have a, a light cone in the system. You can, you can violate, you can actually create, you know, entanglement across the whole system in time of order one. Um, and that, that, and that was actually studied uh, in, in, in this work uh, from San Leach and Ludwig and Fisher from Santa Barbara. Okay, so what, but what this means is that, you know, you, you can actually study this, this uh, mixed phase, um, you know, because you only need measurements within some bounded region, you, you, can, you can sort of efficiently study, uh, study the, the mixed phase, um, you know, just, just through brute force um, post-selection. So that, that's a nice, nice feature. Okay, so, so, so are there any, so are there any questions on these first two parts of the talk? Yeah, I mean, maybe I can ask one more question. Uh, so is, is the idea somehow that measurements can result in spooky entanglement at longer distances provided that somehow there's already uh, large parts of the system that are entangled uh, at long distances. So like I can imagine if there's a big chunk A which is entangled with one, you know, of entangled spins and big chunk B of entangled spins and somehow I make a small measurement connecting A and B, then I could quickly get A and B completely entangled with one another. But if that structure doesn't exist in my system to begin with, then measurement will have a more benign effect on entangle, entangling. Is, is, so statistically, somehow, there is a light cone that's present in this model. Is, is that kind of the? Yeah, that, that seems to be the right, the right picture. The, um, yeah, you, I mean, it, may, it maybe goes back to uh, the effect of measurements on you know, random quantum states in some sense. It, th th these kind of, this, is, this would be like a quantum teleportation event. So quantum, so quantum teleportation, so th there's this known results in quantum formation that um, actually random, you know, highly entangled states are not good for measurement-based quantum computation. You, you really want more like area law type entangled states, like a cluster state or something like that. Um, so I think this goes along with, you know, with with that intuition, and it's what you were describing. Is that it's just a very rare, you know, if you have a random state, it's very rare to get to get this kind of teleportation event. But if if you were to do something like <clears throat> prepare a perfect cluster state and then 
you know measure in some particular pattern, you would you know you would imme immediately create the entanglement. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay. So um, I guess I I just have a couple minutes left. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll yeah. So I'll I'll um. So I'll, right. So now I'm going to tell you about this um this this collaboration with Chris Monroe's group where we're we're trying to you know, study some signatures of this in a basically a programmable ion trap quantum computer. So the system, um, it's a linear chain of ions which are addressed with individual laser beams, and then uh, you know you but it's even though it's one dimensional, it's actually has all to all connectivity um, because, of, because of Coulomb interactions. And so you can, so if you wanna, you can actually by driving this ion with a laser and this one with a laser, you, you can implement a two qubit uh, interaction between them. So these are, unlike the models previously, these are actually, um, you know, more, much more like computer science models, they don't have Spatial locality, um, they're sort of ran random, the random geometry, um, and so the so the model we study is a uh, is is illustrated here. So it's sort of a random graph model. So you, what you do is each time step you pick a pair of sites, you apply an entangling gate, and then you 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 know you measure um, you measure that site with some probability, and you can you can actually get this phase transition we've been discussing by just by changing the basis of measurement. So whether you measure along the direction of the entangling gate or perpendicular to it. Um, and so, you know, one, one of the, one of the challenges in this system is that, um, you know, we have measure, we have this reference and we have the system and then we also have measurements. And at the moment they can't, they can't do measurements uh, mid, it's called mid circuit. So while they're doing evolution, they, they can't do measurements. So they have to defer measurements to the end. And so we, we, have, to, we have to do some kind of embedding where we, we, you know, we, we use some qubits for measurements, some qubits for, for the system and some for the reference. And so we're sort of tra trading off these resources with, with each other. Um, but you know, if you, if you if you do simulations on you know very small sizes, including noise, we we sort of have indications that the you know this basic signature of the transition is, is still accessible. Um, obviously, we want to go to the larger sizes, but um, you know this this is giving us some you know some hints that that this physics is is accessible. Okay, so um, so he, yeah, here I'll just show some preliminary data on system of you know six I think it's a it's a chain of 13 qubits overall but there's six system qubits with one referenced and then we're running a, a depth you know, depth eight circuit um, and so this is so for different circuits uh, we we get you know we measure the entropy of this reference system and so for some circuits it should be it should be in a pure state and on others it will be mixed and so you know so here we you know, we see that basic uh, basic behavior, um, and we're also getting you know good agreement with simulations and experiments. So we're we're hopeful that we can you know start start seeing this full um, you know start seeing the phase transition. And I think this system they're studying it's you know what's is actually an academic it's an academic. Um, Quantum computing system, so they're you know, they're a bit a bit more open to studying things like random circuits, and <laughs> but you know I think they want to get up to thirty two qubits or something. That's their their, their present goal on that platform. Okay, so the um, right. So if we if we look, you know, some of the open questions for this this type of monitored systems, you know, there's actually a huge there's actually a huge class of models that exhibit this type of behavior. So, so one of the, you know, one of the goals is just to sort of map out some of that phase space and try and understand, you know, really the, the physics of these, um, of these systems. And, you know, also including more realistic features like real error correction and things of that nature. Um, 
you know, another point that's come up is, and I think this, com this is coming up in other contexts in quantum computing is that there's really this distinction between success and failure is a little bit too simple. There's, there, there may be more than one type of, you know, type of phase in the system or even, you know, crossovers and things like that. So trying to, to really nail down what, what we mean by success is, a, is you know, some of this work is helping, helping get at, at that question. And, you know, there's another, another question just about understanding phase transitions and understanding, um, you know, fault tolerance as a type of phase transition and, and you know, how do we think about that problem? So I think with, with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention. And we can, we can have more questions, so thanks. Yeah, um, so thank you, Michael, for the very nice talk. Uh, uh, please, uh, sh you know, show your appreciation maybe by using the reactions button uh, virtually. Um, right, so, so are there any questions? Should we? Please. So I have a naive question. Um, I just wanted to know, you're talking about these random measurements. Is this noise coming from the environment or is, is that intentional as a part of your calculation? Yeah, it's it's um, well, it's. I guess there's it's sort of a random measurement, and it has two sources of randomness. So one is the one is the um, the you know the sort of space time position of the measurement, and that's sort of a cl classical randomness that we. You know, we 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 select that by hand. Um, you you can you can interpret it as a as an unraveling of a of a you know certain uh, noisy master equation. Um, but but you know when when you record the measurement, it, it really doesn't become that anymore. It becomes something you know that's more controlled. But then there's another source of randomness, which is the, the you know, the, the born probability. So whether, you know, whether you project on the up or down state. Um, and that's much, that is a much, that's much more intrinsic. Um, so that's, that's actually what makes the, this problem hard to study. And one of the, you know, one of the, pro one that makes it hard that it has this decoding aspect is because of this, this random measurement outcome from the, the born probabilities. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, I think you know it. It it would be nice to to get more more physical models where you know you have real errors. I think that's definitely important. And you you, you could think of it as a this you know this physics might end up being. You know, we don't know how accessible this physics is in generic systems, but you can think of this as an easier quantum information task. Um, so, easier than than what some realistic. Um, yeah, than say implementing a specific algorithm. Often these r random circuit dynamics are they're they're convenient for uh, quantum computing because you. You don't have you 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 can characterize it after you implement it, so you don't have to. You know you you can use the fact that you don't care what random circuit you're implementing as long as it's sufficiently, you know, ergodic. And if your system is long enough, then uh, you're kind of averaging. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, you need a mini qubits. And, So I have a question. Can I can I just jump in with one? Oh yeah. Um, so I, my question is very selfish. I'm in the middle of teaching my advanced statistical mechanics course, and we're learning about uh, uh, 
uh, scaling and renormalization. Uh, and my students have asked me on, for the next assignment to give a, a problem on quantum error correction. Is there mm -hmm. a nice textbook style problem that I can dig out of one of the papers that you, you talked about that would be really interesting for uh, an advanced statistical mechanics course? Um, yeah, there's, so one that comes to mind is there's a, there's a, there's a classic mapping of the surface code to, you know, to a, a certain spin glass model. Um, the, the other, the other paper that's by Preskill and Kataev. Uh, well, I know the Preskill Kataev one. Uh, with yeah. The, the, the uh, correlated errors over a distance. Is that the one you mean? Um, what? Well, yeah, they have a, they have a, they have a, like a, it's Dennis, uh, Landell, Preskill and Kataev. They have a long, a long paper from early 2000s. Yeah, no, I know this one. Uh, yeah, this right. The long range uh, couplings or long range errors. Is that what you mean? With some one over R to the. Uh, no, I think this one just just shows that the they, they they do a map they they actually give a general mapping from a quantum error correction threshold to a as a, a phase transition in a in an Ising model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I think I think this is the one I'm thinking about. Okay, that's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, then there's also a follow up paper from a couple of years ago by by Chubb and Flamia. And they they give a you know they give maybe it's more of a QI perspective, but they give a they sort of understand this mapping much better. So, but then the the other paper I you know I mean this one is a bit hard to to follow, but it's this work you know this this early work on proving fault tolerance thresholds by Aronoff and Gottesman. So, I, but actually, in this paper, she has a mapping to to percolation, um, which it turns out to be the same. It's very similar to the. There's certain mappings to percolation, this measurement problem, and it turns out it's very similar to what she was studying. You know, but you know, I, yeah, yeah. That's some 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 ideas. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's very helpful. Actually, if you if you wanted to talk about this topic. So Adam Nahum is a is a statistical physicist. So he, he his papers definitely present. You know they, they have nice statistical physics perspectives on things. So. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe maybe I can ask a more question then. Um, so. I remember the like Marcus Greiner measured entanglement entropy was measuring this Renyi entropy through doing this Hongu Mandel scheme. So there you need, I believe, two copies of the same state. Yeah, right. Um, so in your scheme, um, I don't know, you, you kind of, it was a bit quick. So there was data of the measurement uh, at the end uh, or the entanglement at the end so how, how are they are they measuring this entanglement uh, between the reference and the system in, in the experiment right so what yeah what we what we do is we actually we do tomography mm -hmm. so for every every circuit um you you sort of map out the the single qubit density matrix and right so that, i mean that that was one of the one of the motivations for studying this um, simpler simpler probes is that you know an entropy measurement is always difficult so have, have just measuring one qubit it it makes that step easy Oh yes. Okay. So there is this. I guess there is this some theorem that somehow mutual information is kind of bounded by all possible correlation functions. Is is that somehow what you're using? So you you measure this um, 
sigma z in this or sigma x or sigma y in the reference and some other generic operator in the system or you just have to measure some operators these three operators in the in the reference yeah so we right we're, we're actually not so the the more honest way to do this would be to measure the entropy of the system and the reference and uh -huh. then you would you would prove that it's really entanglement right we're actually thinking of this purification transition more like a crossover. Um, so we're, we're just measuring the entropy of the, the reference system. Mm -hmm. And, it, and some, mm -hmm. of that, some of that entropy may get actually lost to another environment. Um, okay, okay. So just in case that the noise in the system is quite high, what you might be reading is simply a bad qubit uh, could end up uh, looking like a purification transition in these experiments. Presumably right. noise is controlled enough. Yeah, what, what ends up happening is, um, uh, right, what ends up happening is, so here you still get a pure state. So you see a, you, yeah, you see a crossover between, you know, it'll, it'll, in the pure phase, it will still purify, mm -hmm. but maybe to some residual value. And then you'll see a crossover to a, to this mixed mixed behavior, but you don't know if the mix mix mixedness is, you know, due to the environment or the system. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. So right. that actually makes it a little bit easier. Because <laughs> you get the cheat. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um. Let's see. So yeah, we need we need these kind of tricks for quantum computers. <laughs> okay, um, I think maybe if there are no more questions, let's just thank uh, Michael again. And yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks yeah. for listening. Right. Thanks, Michael. Bye bye.